हेलो स्टूडेंट्स टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द टॉपिक फिजियोलॉजी ऑफ रेस्पिरेशन दिस टॉपिक कम्स अंडर सी ओ वेबसू योर सी बी सी एस सिलेबस सेम फोर कोर नाइन फिजियोलॉजी लाइफ सस्टेनिंग सिस्टम सो लेट्स मूव टू द टॉपिक टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट द फॉलोइंग टॉपिक्स mechanism of respiration transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide in blood respiratory volumes and capacities respiratory pigment and dissociation curve and the factors influencing it so let's start with the topic so the mechanism of respiration the entire physiology of respiration involves certain steps they are breathing or pulmonary ventilation external respiration transport of oxygen to the tissues internal respiration and transport of co2 from tissue so why do you need to respire because respiration gives Uh, by respiration we take in oxygen or by breathing we take in oxygen and oxygen is needed to break down the food substances that is we need energy and the if, uh, how can we get energy if we don't uh, respire so mechanism of respiration we will study today starting with the breathing or pulmonary ventilation so for breathing what we need is a proper structure okay the structure is the lungs here you can see in this diagram the we have a pair of lungs the right lung and the left lung where are they situated inside the body they are situated inside the rib cage in the chest cavity okay the left lung has two lobes the upper lobe and the lower lobe and the right lung has three lobes upper lobe middle lobe and lower lobe also you can see one thing that the left lung has a slight curvature on its side the curvature is due to the placement of heart because heart is present just be, uh, beside uh, just beneath the lungs so that's why the left lung has a slight curvature so that the heart can fit into it okay so if you go deep inside the lungs how it looks like you can refer to the picture at the right side there you can see it looks like a branches of the tree okay so the entire lungs consist of certain parts so our respiratory system started from with the nostrils then the pharynx larynx the trachea okay the trachea then branches off into the right and the left bronchus you can see in the diagram the left and the right bronchus the bronchus again divides into many bronchioles we can see in the next diagram this one so the main uh, the trachea it is uh, divided into two right and left bronchus and this bronchus further divided into secondary bronchus tertiary bronchi smaller bronchi and finally into terminal bronchioles which contains alveoli so here you must remember students that bronchus is for singular and bronchi is for plural okay one thing you can see that trachea is lined by some cartilaginous rings what is the utility of this cartilaginous rings because as we respire as we take in oxygen and we give out carbon dioxide during that time our trachea can get collapse to prevent it from collapsing the trachea is being guarded by cartilaginous rings okay so in the right side uh, we can see that image where the bronchi that is the terminal bronchioles you can see at the end of the terminal bronchioles there are several air sacs okay so these air sacs are called alveoli okay they are small small globules like thing they are called 
alveoli that is the main site of gaseous exchange inside the lungs okay so uh, if you can see that alveoli is entirely guarded by many capillaries okay the blood vessels are guarding the alveoli okay so the red you can see a red uh, capillary and the blue capillaries so red is for the pulmonary vein and the uh, sorry the red is yes the uh, red is the pulmonary vein and blue is the branch of the pulmonary artery so let's move on see the ultra structure of the alveoli so if we go deep and we if we uh, magnify the image of an alveoli what we can see it looks like that uh, uh, you can see that bunches of grapes okay so see that if within the alveoli if you cut the alveoli what we can see there are air spaces in between where the actual gaseous exchange takes place okay so the process of pulmonary ventilation or breathing first we should know that the process of respiration starts with breathing that is we take in oxygen and we give out co2 so the pulmonary ventilation or breathing what is that in a nutshell we all know that that it is the movement of air in and out of the lungs what does breathing do breathing supplies the oxygen to the alveoli that we have seen that are the minute structures present in the lungs they provide the oxygen uh, into the alveoli breathing does it and in return what we give out we give out carbon dioxide that we exhale through the nostrils so breathing the process of breathing depend upon mainly two things the first one is the change in pressure and volume where the pressure and volume of the lungs okay and the second is the change we can see in the next slide the change in the uh, muscles of the chest cavity or the chest okay so breathing depends upon changes in pressure and volume in the thoracic cavity so what is the thoracic cavity the thoracic cavity is that cavity which is guarded by the rib cage okay that entire space that is being guarded by the rib cage is the thoracic cavity so air flow is a normal phenomena that we know that always air flow will be from a higher pressure region to a lower pressure region so that uh, following that principle we can see how does air flow into our lungs when we inspire or when we inhale so for that we should know there are certain muscles that are very much important during breathing what are those muscles see uh, the diagram properly students you can see that uh, a uh, dome shaped muscle you can see a dome shaped muscle just uh, the lower side of the ribs that is called diaphragm okay so diaphragm is a very important muscle that helps during breathing okay it's a dome shaped muscle that separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity okay so the diaphragm is present just here okay so that this is a dome shaped muscle which is present at the lower side of the ribs you can see the outline structure where the lungs are located and the lungs are being guarded by the rib cage okay on the dorsal side of the body we have the uh, vertebral column and on the ventral side we have the sternum you can see the sternum okay and we can see the ribs are guarding the lungs so it is protecting the lungs also our heart is also protected by this rib cage and you can see the diaphragm also another thing you will see that other type of muscles which help in breathing they are the intercostal muscles okay so inter means in between and costal means the ribs that means the muscles which are present in between the ribs okay the muscles which are present in between the ribs 
so they are called intercostal muscles so in this diagram if you see properly the muscles which have been colored orange and pink they are the intercostal muscles that is the muscles which are present in between the ribs and the, uh, these muscles contract and relax uh, and simultaneously they help in breathing breathing in air and exhaling in air that we will see in detail so what are intercostal muscles that you should know if question comes that uh, what are the muscles involved in breathing you should be able to tell that diaphragm and intercostal muscles are two important muscles which help in breathing so intercostal muscles are the muscles which are present in between the ribs and they are of two types you must uh, know this and they are also arranged in two layers the external intercostal muscles and the internal intercostal muscle external intercostal muscle just see the diagram you can see they are arranged outside okay the outside layer that is uh, forming the external intercostal muscle and the inside layer is being formed by the internal intercostal muscle there are also several other muscles that help in breathing but these are two primary muscles which help in breathing okay and we are uh, there are 11 pairs which are present in between the 12 pairs of ribs so inspiration as we know or inhalation so inhalation means taking in the uh, oxygen okay taking in oxygen so how does taking in oxygen occurs there are some pointers here let's see then we will see the diagram in detail so it takes place when the volume of the thoracic cavity increases and simultaneously if volume increase air pressure decrease simultaneous contraction of the external intercostal muscle and the diaphragm so as we have seen the diaphragm will contract and the external muscles will contract what will that cause that will cause the lung volume to increase let us see this diagram we can then follow it in detail just see this diagram so first is the inhalation in this diagram what we can see just look at the diaphragm this is the dome shaped muscle if you follow this the dome shaped muscle has contracted means it will come downwards if diaphragm contracts it will come downwards and the muscles that are present in between the ribs that is the external intercostal muscles they will also contract if they contract the ribs will be pulled outward okay the ribs will be pulled outward so ribs are pulled outward the sternum will be pulled forward as the diaphragm is contracting so the thoracic cavity enlarges as the thoracic cavity enlarges the volume of the lungs will also increase and if volume of the lung increase pressure will decrease just see this diagram during inhalation if vol volume is increasing volume of the lungs are increasing pressure inside the lungs are decreasing so if pressure inside the lungs are decreasing so what will happen to equalize the pressure atmospheric pressure is outside is greater air will come inside because atmospheric pressure is more outside so from air will flow from a region of higher pressure to a region of lower pressure air will move inside the lungs okay i think you should follow it then this is the process of inhalation you can uh, see this diagram also see during inhalation or inspiration diaphragm contracts downwards okay the dome shaped muscle has moved downwards it is giving space for the lungs to enlarge the volume of the lungs have uh, increased so pressure has decreased hence air will move inside and who has triggered these muscles to contract who has triggered the diaphragm to contract or the external intercostal muscles to contract we have a respiratory center in the brain okay in our brain we have a respiratory center in the medulla oblongata we have a respiratory center we can you can sense that respiratory uh, respiration or where when we breathe and they give signal to these muscles to contract okay so this is inhalation 
So, this inhalation is an active process because the muscles need to contract. It is an active process. What about exhalation? When we are breathing out, exhalation just the opposite. Okay, just the opposite. So, but in this case, the process is passive. That is, the muscles do not need to work hard for it. The passive means they are relaxing now. Okay, relaxing. How? The diaphragm is relaxed. So, it has come back to its original position. Diaphragm is coming back to its original position. If it is coming back to original position, the volume inside the lungs is decreasing. Volume inside the lungs is decreasing because it is pushing the lungs upwards. And see that the chest muscles, specifically the external intercostal muscles that had contracted during inhalation will now relax. So, if the external intercostal muscles now relax, what will happen? Then the ribs will go backwards. See, the chest is contracting. So, you can feel while you are breathing in and breathing out when you are respiring. So, you can feel that during breathing in, the rib muscles or the uh, uh, chest bone increases or it can, it uh, just pushes up. While during exhalation, it again contracts. Okay, so the as the chest contracts, the thoracic cavity, the volume of the thoracic cavity decreases. So the lung volume also decreases. So just if the lung volume decreases, pressure inside the lungs increases, increases, and what is uh, what happens in that case? Pressure inside the lungs increased, so air will move out of the nostrils. Okay, we breathe out. And what is the uh, pressure ratio or we can say what is the uh, variation in the pressure? The pressure uh, in the of the oxygen pressure, it remains like 100 mmHg and carbon dioxide we will see, uh, let us see that in, in the next slides. I will not discuss it now. But for this, I think it should be clear that inhalation and exhalation. Let us go through the steps. So, sequential events in inspiration, whatever I just told you, that is being written here. So, the external intercostal muscles contract, okay. Just as we have seen that the external muscles will be contracting and the internal muscles, the in, there is also a layering of internal intercostal muscles, they will relax. So, due to the contraction of the external intercostal muscles, ribs will be pulled upwards. So, ribs are pulled upwards, thoracic cavity size increases, volume increases. Okay, volume increases, hence lungs expands. As lungs expands, air pressure is in, uh, reduced inside. So, to equalize the pressure, we air, atmospheric air rushes inside the lungs. Just the opposite occurs during expiration or exhalation as we just discussed that in this case, now the thoracic cavity size will reduce as if the size re reduces, that is pressure is being built up. So, if pressure builds up, we will give out oxygen. So, just the opposite. So, two uh, muscles you should remember that is diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. In the first case, diaphragm will contract, external intercostal muscles will contract and while exhalation, they will relax and hence the chest muscles will be, as they relax, the rib cage will be pulled backwards, the volume of the lungs decreases, pressure builds up and to equalize the pressure, what happens that we give out, okay, so air is forced out outside. We can again see the difference during inhalation and exhalation that is being caused inside the body. So, what happens? Just uh, do a quick recap. What happens when we do inhalation? During inhalation, just see the layering of the muscles. The external intercostal muscles that are close to the ribs, they will contract and they will pull the rib outwards. So, as they are pulling it outwards and also the sternum is moving outward, they are giving space for the lungs, the volume of the lungs increases, ribs are lifted up and outwards. So, simultaneously the diaphragm muscle is contracting. 
okay so the lungs will expand with inhaled air now see that during inhale exhalation they are moving back to their original position the ribs are contracted because the internal intercostal muscles they will now contract and the external intercostal muscles they will relax diaphragm also relaxes it will go back to its normal position the volume of the lungs will decrease pressure builds up air will be exhaled out so you can see the exhaled air okay so if uh, all these things uh, are occurring means the inhalation and exhalation are occurring when we are taking in the oxygen the oxygen moves in through the lungs okay why i am telling oxygen because the air that we breathe in is mostly oxygen so as we breathe in air the oxygen moves through the lungs and the lungs what are the small small uh, globules that we have seen inside the lungs they are the alveoli or the air sacs so oxygen goes inside those alveoli or air sacs okay so just see this is the diagram of the alveoli okay the alveoli that are being guarded we have seen there are several capillary beds there is a mesh work like capillary beds that is uh, just a network of capillary beds guarding the alveoli okay so now as the oxygen has reached the alveoli it's time for gaseous exchange okay as the oxygen has reached the alveoli it's time for gaseous exchange so which are the two gases that are being exchanged we all know that oxygen and carbon dioxide so oxygen will be taken inside from the alveoli to the this capillary bed it will be taken inside and the blood which is rich in carbon dioxide that carbon dioxide will move out into the alveoli and hence we will expel that co2 okay so that is called external respiration external respiration means it has not reached up to the cellular level it is up now also it is till the level of lungs or the alveoli so this is called external respiration external respiration means the gaseous exchange by diffusion between alveoli and the blood in the capillary alveolar capillaries okay so capillary i think it is clear because what is capillary you can see in this diagram also one alveoli you can see there it is fully surrounded by capillaries okay you can see there are two colors one is red color one is the blue color why the red and the blue that doesn't mean the blood is blue okay that simply means that the uh, color we can see blue that is rich uh, that is less in oxygen that has less oxygen okay and the blood that you can see red in color it is rich in oxygen that the air that we have taken inside okay that is rich in oxygen okay and the ox uh, that the Uh, air that we expel out that blood or you can see the blood or you can say the blood that is being used up by the tissues that blood will be rich in carbon dioxide so that is blue color yes so the, this is the capillaries yes so how does gaseous exchange occurs gaseous exchange occurs by diffusion again the same phenomena that is movement of gases occurs from a region of higher concentration or you can say higher pressure partial pressure to a region of lower partial pressure so the air that we take in is rich in oxygen so the alveolar air is rich in oxygen so and the uh, and the blood that is you can see the rbcs you can see the rbcs lining the capillaries or inside the capillaries i must say they are not so much rich in oxygen there the partial pressure is low the partial pressure is much higher of the oxygen that we have taken in or the air that we have taken in there the partial pressure of oxygen is much high so oxygen will move from a region of high pressure to low pressure by diffusion simply by diffusion so you can see the diagram or you can see the arrow signs oxygen is moving from alveoli into the rbcs into the red blood cell and opposite thing you can see with the carbon dioxide 
where is the carbon dioxide moving the co2s are moving from the rbcs to the alveolus because the alveolus has less co2 the air that we breathe in has less carbon dioxide but the blood that is being used up in the body has more co2 so the partial pressure of co2 is more hence co2 will diffuse into the alveolus so you can just you should follow the arrow sign okay that oxygen is moving from where to where and co2 is moving from where to where okay so gaseous exchange occurs by diffusion between alveoli and the blood in the alveolar capillaries the exchange of oxygen and co2 occurs through diffusion you must remember this if question comes how does oxygen and co2 exchange occurs they occur simply by diffusion due to difference in the partial pressure of the two gases okay so move from a region of higher partial pressure to a region of lower partial pressure so we'll go a bit in detail see again one more diagram i have uh, given for you so that you can understand clearly the you can see the terminal bronchioles and it contains many lobules inside the lobules there are alveoli and the alveoli are surrounded by capillary walls blood capillaries they are fully surrounded by blood capillaries okay one um, that is the pulmonary artery uh, that is uh, that is carrying the deoxygenated blood and one uh, artery you can see that is red color which is the pulmonary vein which is carrying the blood that is again being or you can say it has taken in the oxygen from the alveolus just in the previous diagram as i have shown after is it is gaining the oxygen this capillary bed after it is gaining the oxygen it will move through this uh, pulmonary uh, vein okay the red color you can follow there that it is coming from the pulmonary artery then what it is happening oxygen it is gaining and it is giving out co2 and it is moving out through the pulmonary vein pulmonary vein it will go out through the pulmonary vein then it will go to the heart heart will pump and the blood will go to the different organs of the body okay different organs will get that oxygenated blood after exchange in the organ level or you can say after the respiration occurs at the cellular level again that deoxygenated blood will go to the heart and heart will uh, pump that to the lungs again same thing will continue okay so gaseous exchange in the lungs the vedas blood in alveolar capillaries contain high level of co2 and low level of oxygen because venous blood is that blood which our tissues has used up okay so that's why it is less it contains less oxygen and more co2 so co2 is more in venous blood it diffuses from higher level to lower level so alveoli will pick up those uh, carbon dioxide and uh, it and then we will exhale out the carbon dioxide and same process oxygen diffuses from alveoli to venous blood until equilibrium okay so blood supply to the alveoli this you should know it is important from your exam point of view also one more interesting fact is the physiologic or physiological dead space what is physiological dead space that means that region of the alveoli where gaseous exchange doesn't take place so physiological dead space is Uh, divided into two types one is the anatomical dead space the second is functional dead space okay this we should know because the entire um, air that we take in doesn't is not participated in gaseous exchange okay a slight amount of oxygen is only needed uh, but we take in a lot of oxygen okay so and these dead spaces are the regions in the alveoli where uh, gaseous exchange doesn't take place so anatomical means that anatomical characters or the anatomical features 
of the bronchiole where uh, you can say the sum of the air is uh, remains there so that is the dead space that means no uh, from there oxygen is not used up and functional dead space is certain alveoli you can see that pink color is that alveoli where gaseous exchange is taking place but the blue color in this side it has been shown that in this case there is no gaseous exchange so this is a functional dead space there is no gaseous exchange no oxygen is being taken in so in this case it is a dead space so this is a functional dead space and anatomical dead space those are the anatomical features in the lungs where you can say that air remains or total utilization of air doesn't take place so this was a short uh, fact you should know a small fact you should know next coming to the next sub point of today's topic is the transport of oxygen to the tissues now breathing is done breathing is done from the lungs that is within the from the alveoli the oxygen is been taken up by the rbc so how will the rbc carry the oxygen rbc has something which will carry the oxygen and i think most of you know that that rbc contains a pigment a red colored pigment that is called hemoglobin so hemoglobin will carry the oxygen to the different organs and tissues of our body okay so rbc contains hemoglobin which is a red colored pigment that will bind to the oxygen okay that will bind to the oxygen and it will take that oxygen to the different tissues of our body oxygen is carried in the body in two forms okay or it is carried in the blood in two forms what are the two forms one is oxyhemoglobin form oxyhemoglobin form so the hemoglobin protein that is present in rbc that binds with the oxygen okay so how it is binding that is we should uh, we don't need to know now that exactly how it is binding but hemoglobin will bind to oxygen and one hemoglobin it can bind you can say that it has four oxygen binding sites one hemoglobin okay that's why you can see that with one hemoglobin we have shown that four oxygen molecules are binding okay hp plus 4o2 four oxygen molecule are binding and it is giving oxyhemoglobin hbo2 four that is four oxygen molecules are binded with one hemoglobin molecule so this is the form oxyhemoglobin is the form match um, more, most of the uh, oxygen is being carried in this form 98.5% and the rest of the oxygen is being dissolved in the plasma okay this it is being carried in the blood in a dissolved form that is 1.5% of the oxygen is being dissolved in plasma and maximum is carried in the rbc in the form of oxyhemoglobin so after uh, so the blood is carrying the oxygen carrying the oxygen to where to the different organs and organs are made up of tissue tissues are made up of cells so ultimately the cells will uh, you can say that the cells will get the oxygen okay so ultimate respiration will occur at the cellular level the ultimate respiration will occur at the cellular level so oxygen carried in the form of oxyhemoglobin when it will reach the cells because cells need oxygen if cells don't get oxygen they will die they will not get, they will not be able to do respiration if respiration is not done food will not be broken down food will not be oxidized the food that we take in it is first digested absorbed then that food needs to be the glucose finally needs to be oxidized okay to give energy so to get energy we need oxygen to reach at the cellular level okay so oxygen in the form of oxyhemoglobin and in dissolved form will reach the tissue there what will happen cellular respiration will happen in tissue oxygen is carried in the form of oxyhemoglobin and as it reach the tissue it will dissociate 
the HbO2 that was formed, that oxyhemoglobin that was formed, it will dissociate, it will break down. It will break down, hemoglobin will be separate and it will give the oxygen, it will deliver the oxygen to the cells. Okay, it will deliver the oxygen to the cell where glucose is waiting. And glucose will utilize that oxygen, oxidation will take place, then several uh, glycolysis, prep cycle, everything will run and ultimately energy will be produced. So, oxidation of glucose will release what? It will release, we all know that oxidation releases carbon dioxide as a byproduct, water will be formed and energy that is ATP. That's the most important thing we are living because we, uh, all of the muscles or all the organs in our body, all of most of the, every organ of our body actually needs energy and that energy comes from oxidation or respiration. Okay. So, internal respiration, just look at this diagram students. External respiration occurred at the pulmonary level, that is at the lungs, level of the lungs and the alveoli of the lungs. Okay, pulmonary capillary. Here you can see that oxygen was uh, given or it is uh, by diffusion it was moved from a region of high pressure to a region of uh, low pressure inside the capillaries and carbon dioxide was given to the alveoli. And internal respiration will occur at the cellular level. Okay, at the cellular level, this uh, oxygen rich blood will give the oxygen to the cells and cells will after performing respiration, they will give out CO2 to the blood. So, external and inter internal respiration, they are two different parts of respiratory physiology. When we are talking about oxygen, we should also know which, what is happening to the CO2 that is being formed as a byproduct of respiration. So, transport of CO2 from tissues to lungs and vice versa. Okay. What is happening? So, this spherical shape that you can see or in biconcave shape, this is the RBC. RBC, they are carrying carbon dioxide. Okay. Also, how they are carrying? So, the gaseous exchange occurs at in the respiring tissue, just in the previous diagram, we have seen that tissues are also respiring. They will produce CO2 as a byproduct of respiration. That CO2 is being taken up by RBC in several forms. CO2, when it binds with hemoglobin of the RBC, it forms carbaminohemoglobin, HbCO2, CO2, that is carbaminohemoglobin. Also, carbon dioxide will bind with the water molecules. It will form carbonic acid, H2CO3, carbonic acid. The carbonic acid, then it can readily break down into bicarbonate ions, HCO3 minus and H plus ions. Okay. So, these are the form how CO2 is being carried. So, CO2 is carried in the form of carbaminohemoglobin when it binds to the hemoglobin protein of RBC or it can bind to water in the plasma and form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid can uh, break down to H plus and HCO3 minus ions. So, and what is the gaseous exchange at lung level or alveolus? We have seen that the, the CO2 which was in the bound form will now be released into the uh, alveoli. So, HbCO2 or carbaminohemoglobin is broken down into hemoglobin and carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide reaches the alveoli, then we expel that uh, CO2 out of the lungs. Same thing happens with carbonic acid in the presence of CAH, CAH stands for carbonic anhydrase enzyme. This enzyme breaks down the carbonic acid into water and carbon dioxide. Hence, carbon dioxide is exhaled uh, when we breathe out the air. This is uh, quite a repetition of the previous slide, but this diagram um, you can see that entire thing what is happening with the CO2 also. Next, we will come into the third segment of today's discussion 
lung volumes. So what are lung volumes? The volume of air that uh, is present inside the lungs at a certain point is known as lung volume. Okay, The volume of air a lung can hold. So lung volumes is measured by a special instrument that is called spirometer. Spirometer is used to measure the volume of lungs at set, a certain level, okay, at a normal resting position while deep inhalation or while deep exhalation. Those certain points we can use spirometer to measure the volume of the lungs. And this is a very important topic from your, uh, uh, in your syllabus, uh, in your exam several times it has come. The this uh, graph can be given and from there they can ask which is what okay so starting if you see the graph in the x y axis you can see volume of air in the lungs okay volume of air in the lungs in milliliter and on the x axis you can see the time okay what is happening um, you can see a wave like motion so starting, I will just um, explain it in this way, the tidal volume. Where is the tidal volume? You can see the blue region, it is res uh, written resting tidal volume. Resting tidal volume, what is that? That is the volume of air that is inspired or expired with each normal breathing. Okay, when you are breathing in or breathing out, just at a normal rate. Not that while you are exercising, not like that. It is just a normal when you are breathing in and breathing out. How much of air is present in the lungs that is called tidal volume. So that is tidal volume. You can see this one resting tidal volume. It is 500 ml in adult male. 500 ml of air is um, always inspired in or expired out during a normal breathing. That is called tidal volume. Next is inspiratory reserve volume. You can see that yellow portion above the resting tidal volume, the graph has moved a lot or it has increased a lot up to 6000 ml. So, inspiratory reserve volume, what is that? That is the extra volume of air that we inspire. Okay. So normally we are inspiring and we are uh, expiring. We are giving in, we are taking in and we are again breathing out. But the extra amount of air if we breathe that we can say during deep breathing. Okay, during deep breathing the extra volume of air that we inspire and above the normal tidal volume that is called with the full force. That is called inspiratory reserve volume. And how much is that value? It is almost about 3000 ml. 3000 ml of air is the inspiratory reserve volume is the uh, extra amount of air that we can breathe in during a deep breath with forceful inspiration. <clears throat> Next, we can also see expiratory reserve volume and residual volume. See, expiratory reserve volume where you can see that you can also see that yellow portion beneath the resting tidal volume. Okay, the wave have gone downwards. So that much part is the expiratory reserve volume. That is you are exhaling normal exhalation. That is a part of tidal volume. But we are exhaling more. You have taken a deep breath. You have taken a breath but you have exhaled a long exhalation. That comes under expiratory reserve volume. Okay, what is the explanation? Maximum extra volume of air that can be expired by forceful expiration. Okay, people who do yoga, they do such inspiration or expiration, deep breathe and then exhalation. Okay, in that cases, the lung volumes also changes. In certain persons like who are a good athlete, or who does certain exercises, the lung volumes increases in such persons. So, the maximum extra volume of air that can be expired by forceful expiration 
after the end of a normal tidal expiration okay so that much is quite your 100 1000 ml like you can see in this diagram also that is 1000 ml okay that is the extra volume of air that we can expel by forceful expiration and ultimately you can see the residual volume that remains in the lungs residual volume is 1200 ml so what is residual volume residual volume is the volume of air that remains in the lungs after the most forceful expiration you have expired with a long exhalation but still a certain amount of air remains inside the lungs that is the residual volume okay that is colored deep blue okay 1200 ml that is a residual volume so what we have studied first we have studied tidal volume tidal volume you can see the color code blue color light blue color where the wave you can see that is giving a normal breathing you are taking in and you are giving out uh, air so that is 500 ml of air is being exchanged tidal volume then you are you know, taking up with the uh, forceful inspiration that is uh, inspiratory reserve volume which is 3000 ml and you are giving uh, or you are expiring with a lot force exhalation that is expiratory reserve volume is 1000 ml and ultimately the amount of air remains in the lungs after the most forceful expiration is residual volume which is about 1200 ml so this is all about your lung volumes okay lung volume so lung volumes were four tidal volume inspiratory reserve volume expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume what about this lung capacities or pulmonary capacities they are only the summation of the different volumes if you just add up the different volumes you will get the capacity of the lung okay the capacity of the lungs. So there are several type of capacities of lungs. In the right side, what you can see that uh, they are using a spirometer. Patient is given a spirometric uh, test is being done on the patient to see that whether the lungs is working properly, whether the um, uh, the patient is taking in oxygen or giving out the proper amount of oxygen. So that you he can see or that uh, uh, the doctor can see it in the monitor how much of uh, air is being taken in or taken out that the normal range we have just studied about the different volumes so is it normal or it is coming more or it is coming less so then we can do the proper diagnosis what is the cause of the deviations from the normal okay and these are the different capacities uh, just they are the different summations of like inspiratory capacity is the addition of tidal volume and inspiratory reserve volume functional residual capacity is the summation of expiratory reserve volume and residual volume vital capacity is uh, the summation of these three and ultimately the total lung capacity which is not more than 6 liters okay which is not more than 6 liter that is uh, the summation of vital capacity and the residual volume In this diagram also you can see the capacities, inspiratory capacity. So I have just given the chart where you have seen the summation by adding what you can get the different capacities also. Okay. Next moving on to the fourth segment of today's discussion is the respiratory pigment. The pigment that was carrying the oxygen. We have also discussed it priorly that the pigment was hemoglobin okay so you can see the rbc or erythrocyte erythrocyte contains hemoglobin hemoglobin has four chains okay it has four chains two alpha chain and two beta chain you can also see in the diagram on the right side that there, there are two alpha chain and two beta chain within each chain there is a heme group okay heme group and this is the diagram of the heme group which contains an iron in its core it contains a ferrous iron fe2 plus 
it contain a ferrous ion in its core and this ferrous ion can bind to the oxygen so how many oxygen will bind to a single hemoglobin molecule because hemoglobin is made up of four chains and each chain has one heme moiety and each heme moiety have one iron one ferrous ion so there are four ferrous ion so can bind to four oxygen molecules okay so one hemoglobin can bind to four oxygen molecule and it will form oxy hemoglobin we have already studied that so how does the oxygen is binding to the hemoglobin the process by which oxygen is binding with the hemoglobin is called positive cooperativity they are helping each other cooperative okay so they are helping each other positive positively they are helping okay so positive cooperativity if you see the uh, arrow in the first diagram you can see hemoglobin with the four chains these petals like things are the four chains of hemoglobin and within each chain there is a iron fe you can see the four irons so what how they are binding with the oxygen first you see with this iron one oxygen binds hbo2 one oxygen binds so positive cooperativity means as one oxygen binds to the iron it quickly helps to the other uh, heme groups to bind with the oxygen it will help faster or it will uh, change its configuration quickly to bind to the other oxygen also so hbo2 then again quickly another oxygen binds to it hbo4 then again the third oxygen binds to it hbo6 and ultimately the fourth one that is binds to the iron and it forms hbo8 but you must remember students that this binding is reversible that is the binding is not permanent if it will permanently bind to the hemoglobin then how will it uh, unload the oxygen in the cells the cell will not get oxygen if uh, if uh, hemoglobin is only binding to oxygen hemoglobin also need to give oxygen to the cells for cellular respiration that means this binding is not permanent it is a reversible binding it will again uh, give oxygen when needed in the cells where there is need of oxygen okay so oxygen binding affinity you will see it is increasing so positive cooperativity means in this diagram where we can see the saturation and the partial pressure of oxygen in mmhg as the partial pressure of oxygen increases the binding affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin increases so the red color you can see the red color has increased and ultimately all the four colors or all the four um, heme molecule have taken up the oxygen okay so this has uh, this is called positive cooperativity okay this is also the similar diagram where you can see the presence of oxygen stabilizes the r state what is the r state that the previous one uh, previous diagram we have seen first the uh, you can say that the hemoglobin has bounded only to one oxygen then two then three and ultimately four oxygen molecules were bounded to the hemoglobin molecule okay so the hemoglobin uh, you can say it uh, moves between two states that is the t state and the r state t state is the tau state or the tensed state r state is the relaxed state tensed state is where where it has low oxygen affinity it is intrinsically more stable and it moves to the or it shifts to the r state or the relaxed states where it has high oxygen affinity okay so you can see in this diagram the four globules there you can see there are the four heme molecules okay where iron is present and it is binds with the oxygen simultaneously so from a tensed state it is moving to a relaxed state with which where they it gets a high oxygen affinity so oxygen binding changes the equilibrium between the t state and r state favoring the r state 
okay so we have come uh, quite to the end here we can see uh, the final uh, segment that is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve and bohr's effect okay oxyhemoglobin means the hemoglobin has bounded with the oxygen so it needs to dissociate where it will dissociate when the blood is carrying the oxygen it will reach the different tissues for example the muscles or the liver they need oxygen because they are made up of cells we, uh, they need oxygen to produce energy muscles need energy liver needs energy so that ener for that energy it needs oxygen okay so and in that case hemoglobin needs to unload the oxygen that it has taken it has taken up the oxygen now it needs to unload the oxygen where it will unload the oxygen in the tissues and where it will load the oxygen in the lungs okay it will load the oxygen in the lungs so oxyhemoglobin dissociation means it is saying where the hemoglobin will dissociate to give the oxygen at which stage this we can understand with the help of this curve this is a sigmoid curve okay this is a sigmoid curve we can see the x axis shows the partial pressure of oxygen and the y axis shows the oxyhemoglobin saturation okay so the right side you can see on the x axis you can see partial pressure of oxygen from 0 to 100 and on the y axis you can see the saturation up to 100 percent okay as the partial pressure of oxygen increases for example the lungs pressure is increasing partial pressure of oxygen increases so hemoglobin will be saturated with oxygen hemoglobin is getting saturated with oxygen and the curve is increasing increasing slowly it is increasing and with more partial pressure hemoglobin is saturated more but after after a certain level when all the four molecules of the hemoglobin are saturated with oxygen it attains a plateau level it attains a plateau level this is called the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve where the are left side shows the lung portion and the right side where the saturation is not increasing more that is the respiring tissues so this is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve and there is uh, you can see there are there are two shifts right shift and left shift the right shift where the dissociation curve has moved to the right a bit and the left shift when the dissociation curve had moved left so these there are certain scenarios when such things happen like when uh, when there is so there we uh, there are right shift and left shift so we can discuss about these two topics in the next class where we can uh, see that how this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve uh, moves to the right or to the left that is the factors which affect the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve so this is all about uh, today we will move on to the next class and we will study in detail thank you students